Always the silence as we all sit down. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight at Fox Hills. Um, for those of you who I haven't yet met, I'm Francesca Ogeman White, and I'm the founder of the Beauty Triangle. So we're here tonight to talk about future gains. Um, because obviously when it comes to our skin, our faces and our bodies, the importance of uh, forward planning cannot be underestimated. But as all of our speakers, I think, will attest tonight, just as important is optimising our underlying health. And I think more and more we're starting to see those two worlds collide. Now, when we started the Beauty Triangle, it was with the aim to educate, but also to empower our audiences on all aspects of their health and well-being, and always critically from a holistic standpoint. Um, but it was also to introduce you to the most expert voices in the world of wellness. On that note, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce tonight's amazing panel. We're joined this evening by aesthetic doctor and founder of Italia Clinic in Surrey, Dr. Aggie Satonska. We're also joined by celebrity doctor and London lip queen, Dr. Rita Rakus. And finally, by Professor Mark Whiteley, who is the founder of the Whiteley Clinic and the most pioneering vascular surgeon. So anything to do with veins, here's your guy and my guy. Um, a few things before we get started. Um, you'll find some programs on your, uh, at your place. You'll also find a referral card. So if you would like us to introduce you to any doctor that you hear speak here tonight, then you can just leave your email address, tick the box, um, and we'll connect you after the event. Um, we'll also have a Q&A at the very end. So if you do have questions, then please um, store them up and feel free to put your hand in the air and ask them when we come to it. Um, what else? Oh, we also have an amazing goodie bag for you, which has um, some treats from Italia Clinic. I think there's a £50 voucher in there, um, a skin aid sample, Epiance, um, and some really wonderful publications by the Whiteley Clinic as well. So please don't leave without taking a goodie bag. Um, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to our panellists. They're going to say a quick hello, introduce themselves, and then we will get started. Dr. Aki. Hello, Hi. everyone. May I start from saying what an honor to sit at this amazing panel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Fox Hills for having us. Uh, it's, it's beautiful when you can actually see what's outside. Uh, the grounds are just amazing. Um, my name is Aggie. Um, I am a medical director and founder of Atelier Clinic. Around the corner, Egam. Um, Convenient. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, and uh, thank you for, for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rekas. Hi, it's uh, Dr. Rita Rekas. I'm so happy to be here in such a beautiful setting. I think I'll have to come back through the day. Yes, and uh, we've got our clinic in Knightsbridge. We've been there for about 30 years and we specialise in all non-surgical uh, aesthetic and anti-aging procedures and, and preventive medicine. And I, we send a lot of patients <laughs> to Professor Whiteley. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years. A nice synergy on this panel already, I can tell. Um, and finally, Professor Whiteley, would you like to... Thank you very much. It's an honour to be here again. Thank you so much. It's lovely speaking to people that I know quite well as well in the, in the, uh, in the medical world. Um, I'm very much on the scientific side. I, I believe that we should always use science to get to the basis of where we get to. And I'm very pleased to see so much of aesthetic medicine is now becoming scientifically based as well. So a lot of my research is based on venous disease, obviously. That's what we um, specialise in. Um, and we do a lot of cellular biology, histology, as well as outcomes for patients. So it's the trying to get to the nuts and bolts of what happens in the venous system. And more and more, that's sort of spilling over now, more and more into the aesthetic side, as we'll probably touch on later. So uh, I hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And it's so interesting that you say that because actually it's, it was going to be the sort of first point that we made with this talk, you know, I think talking Sorry. about prevention. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I love it when everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, talking about prevention, you do often think it's about the physical appearance, but actually, as you say, you know, the worlds are colliding and it is more and more about underlying health. Um, so, on to our first speaker, Dr. Aggie. Um, Dr. Aggie introduced herself. She's an aesthetic doctor um, and she has an incredibly holistic sort of approach, I think, when it comes to treating the face and the skin. Um, but Dr. Aggie, maybe you can start by explaining, when, when people come to see you for preventative treatment, what are the common questions that they're sort of asking? What are they seeking? Most of the time they are slightly overwhelmed. There is so much going on there mm -hmm. that it is very difficult for them to actually see what is the right decision for them, you know, yeah. what... And then obviously the question, they, there is the fear of, you know, will it be visible? Will it be safe? Will it be, you know, uh, something that my friends, my family will notice. Are people sort of worried about people noticing? Still, They're worried think? about, my patients are worried about changing their appearance. They don't want to look different. They mm. want to remain looking well and healthy. They don't want to start looking 
strange. Yeah. Um, they <laughs> and I don't think anyone wants to look younger per se. They sort of want to look like no, the best version of fresher. themselves at that age. Fresher is the common. Yeah, you know, it, it kind of comes back. I just want to look healthy. I want to look well. I want to look fresh. What mm -hmm. can I do to prevent things that are inevitably happening mm -hmm. um, and, and creeping on us? And uh, and that's that's great because at this stage we can actually do a lot. Um, yeah, you definitely very can. discreetly, you know, with without um, you know making patients look like they have um, had some treatments. Um, so I think it's first of all is putting patients at ease mm -hmm. and as, as Professor Whiteley said you know there is a lot of evidence-based treatments now so we can safely discuss you know and tell them you know to talk about the data and, and yeah, what's, exactly. what's out there what's safe and and tell them what kind of um, outcomes realistically they can expect and talk about expectations as well and tidying it up a little bit so mm -hmm. it is not so overwhelming and then we you're, can you're start so right, slowly. it's definitely overwhelming and I think anyone who is new to any form of aesthetic treatment you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to know where to place an aesthetic clinic. It's not a beauty salon. Um, yes. It's not necessarily, it's, it's quasi-medical, but it's not sort of going to your GP when you have a medical condition. It is somewhere in between, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and so what does the consultation with yourself look like? Um, so we try to start from the very basics. So we offer, and please do let us know if you would be interested, we can send you some information about skin analysis. So we do, mm -hmm. send, do start with skin analysis. Um, so it is not our opinion anymore, it's the data the patients see, mm -hmm. um, clearly you know where are the problems, where are the problems that are visible straight away, but also what is the future, what will potentially happen if we won't start to it's, do it's, something it's about it. It's hearing beneath the surface of the skin and yeah. it's seeing the things that you can't necessarily see manifesting on the skin surface right now. Exactly. You know, I, I did the Vizier scan uh, or sort of a similar imaging device, I think, and I saw so much sort of underlying pigmentation that hasn't yet come to the surface, but I know it's mm -hmm. there. So it's a little bit like looking into the glass ball, yeah. <laughs> and, but, but, but science-based, and <laughs> telling patients, you know, we could do small steps, small changes toward you know your skincare, lifestyle, etc., to start to target those things mm -hmm. and prevent things that are going to happen and going to be more visible. So we, I know it is a little bit difficult in the beginning because patients you know feel a little bit vulnerable at this moment. You know we're discussing things that are a little bit difficult for it's them. It's difficult to discuss. if a patient feels like they're being sort of attacked yeah. or told something negative about themselves. Exactly, and then we're showing them things that they may not want to see, you mm -hmm. know, to that degree. But at the same time, we're giving them the sense of control, telling them that there is something positive, we can actually do something about it. Exactly. And, uh, and, and I, I suppose it helps you to plan their journey as well. You know, you can then devise exactly the right topical ingredients, the treatments you're going to do. Absolutely. So this is the first step. Then we obviously discuss the expectations, the, um, the concerns. Um, and uh, we talk about what we can do to, to help them. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, we create very detailed treatment plan. And it's very individual. So this is, it actually takes a lot of time doing this consultation, mm -hmm. skin analysis, and then the, the, this chat, as we call it. But it actually is also educating patients, explaining them what's happening, you know, yeah. why um, those things are visible, and then planning. Regarding, you know, we also listen to patients and we, we try to find out where the boundaries are because not everybody wants yeah. to take it, you know, to, to yeah, that's all levels important. of what's available. Yep. Um, some people just want to have a little bit of advice in terms of their skin care or the supplements mm -hmm. or what they but can There's do a lot that you can affect just by sort of switching up somebody's skin care, yes, right? I mean, exactly. how... What are the sort of, I suppose, key ingredients that we would need to be using if we are looking to prevent visible aging? So it used to be a simple question, but it's not anymore. No, there's, there's so, so much. much on there. And again, it's overwhelming. You yes. know, like you said, aesthetics, the skincare industry, there's so much out yeah. there. Um, starting from the very, very basic, as boring as it sounds, that's exactly how I say to patients, skin, sun protection. That's you know that's that's the most uh, and th those products are just great these days. They are not any longer greasy, sticky, whitish yeah. uh, products. They're actually really nicely packed with antioxidants. So there are already already combined, um, and and we can choose the right product to the skin. You know, if it's more mm. acne prone skin, you know, the oil free products. So there is a lot we can do even in this small um, area of of sun protection, mm -hmm. and then. Um, we 
just want to have this shield to, to protect the skin from the free radicals or antioxidants, um, peptides, Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know sometimes a little bit of retinoids. Uh, yeah, what are evening. your thoughts on retinol? Is that sort of suitable for everybody? I am a little bit. I'm careful with retinoids, so I I like to stimulate the the fibroblasts a little bit, but I don't want to disturb the you know the skin too much. I don't want patients to have any redness, any dryness. And I people think who are prone to the sort of redness or rosacea might sort of exactly. So again, we're going back to the skin analysis. We're looking at you know whether the skin is sensitive uh-huh. or not, whether it can take retinol, whether it will tolerate it. If not, there are other options. Yeah. So this is all, and the skin analysis is linked to our product. So we can actually, looking at the concerns, you know, the level of hydrations and inflammation and redness, mm. we can choose not only products, but also uh, we can work with devices like you know, IPL, to reduce the redness, to reduce the inflammation, mm-hmm. to reduce the pigmentation. Yeah, the inflammation is key, isn't it? Yes. It's the number one cause of aging when it comes yeah. to the skin. And then we go into more sophisticated, so I'm still buzzing from this morning, <laughs> I told you about it this morning. Your exosomes training. Training, exosomes training. Tell, what are exosomes? So exosomes are little micro vesicles. So these are little um, nanoparticles that contain lots of active ingredients and they packed with active ingredients. They mm-hmm. packed with growth factors and peptides and NADs and all of those. It's biohacking, basically. It's yes, amazing. fascinating. But again, <laughs> interesting how sort of medical biohacking is infiltrating the aesthetic world. So we can we can actually use them within our existing treatments when we microneedle, when we you know disturb the barrier of the skin. We mm-hmm. can use this moment to um, to in, to introduce uh, those um, exosomes into so, the skin. So you might do some of sort of skin, skin needling treatment, yes. um, and and then you're sort of applying it what topically as a serum on. You can top apply, yeah. So that they are licensed at the moment for topical use. So mm-hmm. we are using it on top of the skin that's been just microneedled, whether this is. Skin pen, or Morpheus Eight, or, or you know, um, even with in conjunction with ultrasound uh, treatments, and we're putting some you know masks that are uh, soaked with those exosomes later. So mm-hmm. we're using this moment to to, to uh, you know introduce as many of those active ingredients as possible. Um, so yeah, so we, the question about skincare, it's becoming more and more complex. Yeah, definitely, especially when there are all these sort of very cutting edge ingredients that you're now sort of able to use. I mean, I wanted to ask you about sort of entry level treatments if you are concerned about sort of visible aging. What, is, is there one sort of best treatment? Is it very much, I suppose, dependent on the patient who's coming very to see you? It's very dependent, again, starting with consultation, assessing the skin. We then try to you know find and, and understanding the, where, where the patient wants to take it as well. We're trying to find this perfect treatment plan. Um, so skincare always number one. Mm-hmm. Um, then we <coughs> talk about devices like you know IPL, um, the light, you know LED, LED light. Yeah. Uh, this is this Which is really nice. You always put that on top after yeah. a facial, don't you? It's very yeah, common. We always we feel every like we're opportunity beach. we have to, yeah. <laughs> to use it in LED. the clinic. It's it's great because it's so good um, uh, for the skin, but also it it makes us feel better. Um, it's, it's true, and particularly yeah. sort of in weather like this. So you and I have spoken about this before, yeah. sort of offline, but you know, very much sort of when we're in sort of dark and dreary weather, you know, the importance of light and sort of feeling feeling healthier and feeling happier the can't be underestimated. You know, it's just hitting January, so we yeah uh, we do a lot of those light treatments, and it just makes people feel better. Um, but it's it's great for the inflammatory response of the skin as well. Mm, so exactly. that's that's lovely too. Um, and then, you know, if patients are open to this, we can discuss, you know, uh, controlling the muscle strength and um, maybe a little bit of a skin booster and maybe restoring the volume that's been lost. You Tell know? me a bit about the, the skin boosters, because there are so many skin boosters on the market now. I mean, how do you know what's right for the patient who sat in front of you? Do you use different alternatives? Do you have yes. one that you prefer? Um, I do. So I use um, <coughs> Viscoderm, I use Profilo, we use Redensity One, we use SkinCo. So it again depends of what we want to, whether this is hydration that we want to um, uh, address, whether this these are tiny f- uh, fine lines and wrinkles. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Skin Boosters just because they are giving us this deep tissue hydration and mm-hmm. everybody looks plump and you know really smooth and uh, that's what all my patients love for the first few weeks but then it is the collagen stimulation so long term it does help us to um, to stimulate fibroblasts to produce new collagen and is that because of the the substance that you're injecting or is it 
purely because of the mechanical sort of action I of I the think injecting. It's both. From what we see from the data, I think it's both. It's 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 you know we naturally we're injecting hyaluronic acid, which yeah. is going to attract water. It's going to hydrate the skin, but also we. On a very obviously small level, we're traumatizing and cre creating this control um, injuries to the skin, and yeah. that is going to stimulate collagen production. And, and it's well. such a nice sort of alternative, I suppose, for people who necessarily don't want things like toxin, who don't want dermal fillers. Mm -hmm. um, I have so many friends who sort of don't necessarily want those treatments, but they all love skin boosters. You know, I see them and they're like, I've had Profilo, my skin looks amazing. But I, I would even use different skin booster on the same patient. You know, if mm -hmm. I want to hydrate around here, I would hydrate. But and I would use Viscoderm around the perioral area, the okay. area that moves, that sometimes patients are concerned about those top barcode lines, the, the lines on the, on the top yeah. lip. And we don't want to use, I don't want to use fillers there. I don't want patients to become more stiff, to become, you know, this is the area that is on animation, anything shows. Mm -hmm. So I want to do something that will just lift and improve the skin texture without making the skin look a little bit more stiff on movement, a little bit puffy. Well, it's, it's one of the instant giveaways, isn't it? If yeah. you if you can't emote or express in the same way that you would have naturally. Exactly. Yeah. And um, what was the next question I was going to ask you? Yes. When, when it comes to sort of general health and well-being, you know, how much do you think these sort of treatments, these aesthetic treatments, how much can they impact sort of one's longevity, one's, I suppose, feeling of self-esteem? Um, what do you think? Greatly so, absolutely. So um, I think there is a lot of interlinking between what we think of, you know, as classic medicine and, you know, things that patients would receive from the GPs and mm -hmm. then um, things that we offer in aesthetic medicine clinics. Um, we started something that's called lifestyle medicine in our clinic you know we, we talked about this um uh, dr hannah joined us she's a gp and she's um uh, she specializes in hormonal health and mm -hmm. uh, uh, nutrition and uh, sleep issues and that's so nice because all of those factors really do impact the treatment Absolutely. that you're doing if somebody's hormones are out of balance if their sort of stress levels are off the scale if they're not sleeping the treatments that you're doing are not going to have an effect they're not going to have such an effect as they should be and sometimes i see that you know uh, with my patient that would sat on the couch and say you know i'm so stressed i don't sleep i uh, mm. i'm really tired my skin you know my hair can you do a little bit of you know a little bit yeah. here and it's you're like the answer like does not lie in botox <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> this is not going to fix the problem so we wanted to to reach a little bit deeper and support patients you know um give them the best outcomes of our treatment mm -hmm. by looking as at them as a whole um so that's something that we've started unfortunately dr hannah has some health issues at the moment so we are putting it on hold but it's all coming back soon hopefully okay. and uh, and that's that's the one that's the one thing that uh, really makes um, it kind of join together mm. but at the same time when patients look radiant when they uh, you know don't look tired because you know we just restore a little bit of volume or yeah. we've used some skin boosters or we tidied up the um, skin care and they don't have eczema and they don't look, you know, very red because of the rosacea, etc. It just boosts their confidence. Oh, hundred um, percent. So they absolutely they feel much, much better, and yeah. they feel more confident, and they tell, come back and tell us all of that. I That's think your lifestyle satisfying. medicine um, sort of offering is going to be so phenomenally successful mm -hmm. because actually, once you're safeguarding your baseline health, you know, we often talk about aesthetic treatments as being the icing on the cake, don't we? And mm -hmm. it and it really will sort of just give that extra little something which i think people absolutely see and we we supplement patients you know already so we've uh, you know we use things like and you will find it in your lovely goodie bags we use skin aids so we use collagen supplements which mm -hmm. are those building blocks that are going to uh, signal our body to produce more collagen so there is um, lots of evidence that this is uh, helping our own collagen production we're supplementing nad which is this coenzyme that is taking part in hundreds of processes in our body and um, and we lose it as we age we know mm. every 20 years we produce 50 percent less so it is actually at some point um not a lot. everything over time it yeah. seems like <laughs> so we are we are targeting that too so that not only so this is again on a cellular level we're trying to um to help patients not only to look better but to feel better because mm -hmm. that's going to boost 
not only their hormonal health and their skin and their hair, and, uh, but also the energy levels. Yeah. Um, so that's important too. And um, you're right; it has to be that sort of perfect sort of balance of aesthetic, physical, but also emotional. Yeah, sort of the magic exactly. triangle that brings it all together. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Aggie. My that pleasure. was incredibly interesting. Um, and if anyone has questions for Dr. Aggie, then do, do save them until the end and we'll come back to you. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rita Rakus. She introduced herself. She is the London Lip Queen, the London Machine Queen. I mean, her clinic in Knightsbridge <laughs> is an absolute <laughs> hotbed of innovation. She has a, a device, a, a machine, a modality to fix absolutely any aesthetic or you know, longevity-based concern. Um, but following on from the conversation that Dr. Aggie and I had, Dr. Rita, maybe, um, maybe we can t discuss a little bit about that sort of concept of longevity. Is, is this something that you're seeing more patients request? Is it something that you're seeing in the industry sort of in terms of what people are looking for from their treatments now? I think, um, as you said, longevity is so important. And the obviously more progressive way to look at it is not uh, lifespan, but health span. You know, you want to be as healthy for as long as possible. And uh, I've been very fortunate to be associated with the Buck Institute in California and also with the University of Singapore Anti-Aging and uh, as Professor Brian Kennedy, who's a worldwide expert. And it's very interesting that there are now quite a few procedures and that most of them are natural that will greatly help you with your health span. And uh, even some of our cosmetic procedures have now been shown to help with um, health span. And one of the things that personally frightens me, and I think a lot of people feel in the same boat, that you can be quite healthy, you can be looking good, doing well in all parts of your life and business, and then all of a sudden something like dementia of whatever type could just hit you, mm -hmm. and that's it, it's like a Russian roulette. There's been a lot of progress being made in the last few years on how to start preventing that from an early age, so late 20s, early 30s. And when I first studied medicine in Australia many years ago, uh, heart disease, there wasn't so much prevention. I remember I first going to the first Dr. Ken Cooper aerobics clinic in Dallas, Texas, where they were running on treadmills and looking at ST segment depression. And then all the prevention of heart disease uh, became very commonplace. Uh, and it's the same now because, as you know, most diseases, cancers, aging, it's all caused by inflammation. And so the whole idea is to reduce inflammation as much as possible in the body and improve your immune system. And for example, and we may get on this a bit later, but one of our hero treatments at the moment is uh, MSculpt Neo, which is a, a, an innovation by BTO. And I don't have, I, I just was, I've got no shares in any <laughs> of these companies or anything. No but it does 20,000 contractions on uh, in 30 minutes on 10 areas of the body. So you can have your mummy tummy done, inner thighs, outer thighs, arms, bottom, uh, love handles, all that sort of you thing. You can M-sculpt your entire body now, can't you? Exactly, exactly. But, but the point with M-sculpt as well is that it's, uh, it's basically a rehabilitation device, isn't it? It, it came yes. from the world of physiotherapy. Exactly. And now there have been quite a few papers written and there was even a an article in the Daily Mail, uh, the guide to everything, <laughs> better than, you know, <laughs> new scientist or anything like that, whatever you, one reads in the Daily Mail. Uh, so, but the better coordination you have and the better fitness you have, it has an anti-aging effect. And for example, in that particular article, they mentioned that uh, if you're very fit and your coordination is good, there's um, a link to the hypothalamus, which is a little area in your brain and it improves the blood flow, which improves memory. There's also certain hormones and products released that stimulate. When I was at medical school, they told us, once your brain cells are dead, that's it, lost forever. Now it's shown that you can regenerate brain cells and uh, by so being through physical activity, through exercise. One of them is that. And for example, they have these simple tests. If you are very active and your balance is good, you know, how fast you can... And this only applies to when you get a bit older. A lot of the young ones wouldn't realise, but, you know, how fast you can get off a chair, your step test, all that sort of thing. Uh, it does affect uh, your mental ageing. So it's very interesting that... Uh, and for example, just another thing about the MSCOP Neo, I didn't even realise that more women die of heart disease than breast cancer. So one of the classic uh, risk factors for heart disease, which I'm still working on mine after COVID, <laughs> is that midriff bulge. 
So it's like the hormonal a, belt that everyone sort of complains about. And not only does that look aesthetically better, but it does reduce one of the risk factors for heart disease. So it's quite interesting how a lot of the cosmetic <coughs> procedures and even Botox now, as we've all read slowly, you know, it's got Prevents an depression. Anti- Exactly, and for example, what the easy way to think about it, if I sit up straight, which I should be, you immediately feel better. And then they've shown now that if this sort of your Botox areas are more relaxed, even before you look in the mirror, the internal feedback makes you feel better. And I really noticed this after COVID because so many of my patients came rushing in after we were closed. Mm. Dr. Rita, I really need my Botox. And some of them maybe just had a tiny line but it was the antidepressive and the feel-good factor that made such a difference. Mm. So there's such a good crossover I think between your, your cosmetic clinic, we're treatments. definitely seeing it more and more. So you were one of the first to launch MSculpt, weren't you? Exactly. And then you, you sort of morphed that into MSculpt Neo, which is the muscle stimulation plus the radio frequency. And which we, we, uh, melts 30% fat and tightens the skin. And you've got some amazing new applicators. I actually sat on the, the treatment edge. bed a few the weeks edge. ago. It's the edge, and it's an amazing sort of hinge-like corset that sort of clamps around your waistline. And it helps you so much with prevention of back pain or even uh, produce, uh, reducing back pain. Mm. And then just to switch totally the system machine to that... You're going to talk about the MZL. Yes. 11,000 Kegels in half an hour. I don't think I've done 11,000 <laughs> Kegels in my life. No, me neither. But you even sit on it totally closed. It feels quite pleasant, and you have about six sessions. And besides the core to floor tightening, you know, with the um, scalp tummy and the M cellar, and they've done a lot of studies and research, especially in the States, about reduction of from oops moments to more serious situations where we're actually having to wear pads. And also, even if you haven't had children, prevention of getting up uh, in the night later on in life. So it's very, very good for central core tightening. And even men can sit on it, can't they? Yes, it's very helpful. I think all these things we're talking about, actually, as much as we're, apart from Pavel, um, all sort of women in this room, um, all of these treatments are sort of also applicable to men, aren't they? Yes, of course. And of course. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Panel aside. Um, But so going back to the M-Sculpt, this is obviously the the sort of high femme technology, the radio frequency, the M-Seller is the sister chair. I mean, why, why are people sort of seeking solutions to these sorts of issues nowadays? I mean, what, what has changed, I suppose? I think because the same as the easiest one to compare it is, you know, when I first started and I was, you know, assisting in plastic surgery for about 10 years, surgery was king. And then it's the same as what happened in Professor Whiteley's area, you know, the sort of technology improved and improved. I remember in the old days, the only thing was to sort of rip the veins out, you know, <laughs> strip it out. And... Um, so, uh, whereas now, you know, the things you can do are really marvellous. So, it's the same as, say, your iPhone. You think of, I remember the first phone we had was in the boot of the car. You know, it was like <laughs> the size of a brick. Now you go iPhone 6, 10, 12, 14, and technology is just going through the roof. I mean, when I first started, the only machine, cosmetic machine, was Casey, which was a long time ago. So the thing is that um, uh, technology has just gone totally through the roof and they say the latest iPhone has got more power in it than when they landed the men on the moon, if they landed them, I believe. <laughs> but, but, um, so it's quite interesting and that's why it's changed so much because technology has gone through the roof and you're actually getting results. I think it's nice that we're actually seeing technology in a more positive angle as well rather than saying we spend too much time on our phones and on our tablets and watching screens and the blue light. You know, it's actually using technology to improve our, our physical appearance, our aesthetic appearance. I mean, one of the things that we could mention is the um, the diastasis recti that happens when a lot of women have children and, you know, the, the muscles actually split and I think is it the, the M sculpt has been proven to yeah, bring the muscles back it together. together. And you know, so for example, a lot of the say of the M sculpt neo uh, in the old days, the only thing was surgery. Now you can achieve quite a lot of muscle, uh, you know, re- not repair, but coming back together without surgery. The same as with um, the M cellar chair, you know, the, the dreaded meshes. Yeah. And um, 
So whereas now you can have quite a lot of improvement without having any operations whatsoever. And barely even taking your clothes off when you sit on the MZL chair. I mean, it's incredible. And I remember when I first started, uh, you know, with the plastic surgeon training, the only thing for arms, inner thighs, all this was, you know, you'd have scars from here to here, the mm-hmm. inner thigh lift, the, um, you know, the. Well, I mean, we still can't, if you've got a massive overhang, you still have to have an abdominoplasty, but you could do quite a bit. So this liposuction now probably reduced by 50%. Uh, so there's so much that technology can do. It's quite exciting. And, and, and how safe. often do, sorry to interrupt, yeah. how often does the subject of hormonal imbalance, of menopause, um, how does that sort of come into conversation? Does it come up frequently? And does it impact the treatments that we're doing? It does come up. And it's very important that I suppose we're very spoiled in our clinic uh, because most of our patients have got a good lifestyle and hormonal doctor to go to. So when they come to us, they're usually reasonably sorted out. And I think the other problem or situation with us is as well, because we don't have a hormonal department, mm-hmm. uh, they're not anyone who's seeking advice in that area. But it's extremely important to have your hormones well sorted for all the other treatments to work well. Mm, no, 100%. And, and what about the sort of issue of safety and responsibility? Because if we're looking at preventative treatment, you know, there might be younger patients who are coming to see you who are seeking all sorts of injectable treatment, dermal filler, toxin. How do you go about actually doing preventative work whilst still being safe and sort of ethical about it? Well, my classic situation, as from back in the 90s, I've got, you know, the title, <laughs> London Lip Queen. So, of course, I get a lot of uh, patients come to see me about their lips, especially the young ones. So I try to be quite firm and luckily now we've got, we started off uh, with the hydrofacial and the perk treatment which gave you a little bit of a boost. But What's now, that, like an exfoliation for the lips? An, an infusion of different natural products. Uh-huh. Now we've got the new Advert Light Laser and also the Pro Deep, and it's a laser that hard, hardly hurts, very little redness, No, it's nothing like Fraxel afterwards, you know, where you've got all scabbing and peeling, but it will actually improve the volume of your lip, improve the, the texture of your skin. So I usually have the mom and the daughter coming in the daughters. Yes, I'm turning 18 in one week, you know, because we don't treat anyone under 18. And the poor mother's there sort of, you know, really worried. And so I try to talk them into having preventive treatments and things like the Advilite first. And then I say, look, you know, you're 40, 50 years younger than me. I just imagine having 50 years of injections into your lips. You know, you're going to look really ridiculous. Uh, And And that's another nice benefit of you having sort of anchored so much, I suppose, in machines as well. It is a sort of slower, more sustainable route to to doing injectable treatment. And they can have these machine treatments which will improve their lips. Mm. Uh, However, I I try to counsel them and I don't refuse. I said, look, if you've got a special event, we may consider doing your lips because otherwise they'll just run off somewhere else. Yeah, Yeah, they'll go somewhere on the high street. Uh, But I also try and... A counsel them in that yeah, and you'll see if we did do a small treatment you'll see it's not going to make so much of a difference probably 80 percent of the young ladies that come in don't need it having said that i had a retired catholic priest come in and have his lips done and really? say, it's not always young <laughs> not ladies. your average patient <laughs> when i was at convent school back in australia i never imagined i'd be injecting You're at convent Catholic. school. <laughs> yeah. oh, the catholic priest lips but the thing is that um so i try and counsel them and also to try and appreciate their own beauty you know i said just the fact that you're 20 years old is f- amazing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> said, and if Enjoy I, that. If I had to look back at all at the time I've wasted worrying about this and that, I said, if only I could go back to being 20, no matter how you looked. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Just being 20. You have youth on your side, but not necessarily the confidence at that age, I think. Exactly. And as um, Dr. Radley mentioned, we try to make people more confident it's not more beautiful it's not to change them but just to bring out their inner charisma and their confidence and that's really what we try and do i mean bringing out <laughs> yes good nice. good note to end on that or quite enough um building on that you did have one amazing launch this week in your clinic which instills confidence but also does amazing things for your face oh yes well, what was so, that <laughs> so um, listening as well <laughs> we sorry i've just got to tell you this uh, we nearly killed the journalist's dog who came in to no, she came in to have the treatment and she had her puppy in the, the dog park. came into the clinic and so she said it was late at night she said oh I've got to leave because my I said we'll bring it in and we had the launch and we had all stars you know from the 
from the streamers and everything, yeah. the dog ate some of the stars, was choking for oh about an hour. <laughs> and you can imagine we had this major journalist in. <laughs> we nearly killed a dog. I want to know who it was now. <laughs> so Not the drama that you're the, hoping that's for. That's an <laughs> So anyway, M Sculpt and then M Sculpt Neo and the, the two types of innovative um, energies are the type when you go through an MRI scanner and then a different type of radio frequency. So now they've got it for the face. So they can, it's the first machine ever that can selectively tighten muscles in the face and lift them. So you'll get a much better jawline, it'll tighten you all up here, redefine your cheeks to how they were a few years ago. It'll tighten up here as well and give you that nice lift and help a lot with not having to have quite as much Botox. And how does it work? Is it sort of applicators yes, that sit on the it's, face? It's t two applicators here and one here. Now it looks very simple to put on, but then we have to dial it all with all the special applications for all the different muscles. Then mm. it's also infusing radio frequency, which tightens the skin and also gives you about 30-40% more collagen in your skin. So it's quite a miraculous treatment and um, you have four treatments of 20 minutes each and you walk out and it looks you look normal so it's very very exciting and it's taken and uh, not that you know we have to slavishly follow the USA but it's taken the USA by storm mm. and what's interesting most of um, the big plastic surgeons are using it over there very successfully uh, as an early treatment for, you know, so it's a preventive. And then, of course, the people that don't want to have surgery when they're older, but it's, it's quite, it's the first time you've been able to tighten muscle and tighten skin as well. I mean, without having a facelift, basically. Mm. What's it called? M-Face. M-Face. Oh, e -M -face. Oh, yes. So it's we're the first ones to have, to have it. it. We just have it. Just got it on um, Thursday. So but you've not had it yourself yet. I haven't too busy. because I can't get on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously in hot demand. Thank you, Dr. Rakus. That was really interesting. And I think everyone probably wants to know about the M face. Including Sorry about me. the dog so, story, uh, but it was just <laughs> the most, uh, You can see what it's like in a cosmetic surgery practice. It's not only just being serious and doing consultations. We've got all sorts of dealing things Dealing with going dog dramas on. as well. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Akers. Um, so our final speaker is Professor Mark Whiteley. He is the founder of the Whiteley Clinic. He's also the brains behind many of the modern day devices used in vascular surgery. Um, so he really is the go-to guy for, for veins. Um, Professor Whiteley, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about the complaints that patients have when, when they come to see you relating to their veins. Uh, the big problem we've got is veins is a Cinderella subject. So people in the past have been told for generations that veins are only cosmetic. Yeah. So um, we, we had a very interesting situation where the CQC came around and saw our clinic and we got exceptional, which very few people get. So thank you. And we, but the thing that's interesting about it is they wouldn't let us put it up on our website because um, we, we sort of, uh, having come around and done all the bits and pieces and looked at our research and everything, they said, oh, we don't allow cosmetic clinics to show CQC, only medical clinics. So ask them to come back again. But what's the definition of a vein clinic? It surely exactly. is medical. Well, that's the trouble. So the, the, even the CQC think of veins as being cosmetic. So when we went through 100 sets of notes and showed them, when you could look at the leg ulcers, the venous reflux, varicose veins, everything like that, even ladies who come in, or men come in, I had one today, he came in to see me, and she'd had um, stripping uh, 32 years ago. She came and said, I just don't like the looks of my veins. Mm -hmm. um, and when I looked at the legs, she had tiny little um, brown spots, and she's heading for leg ulcers. And oh even goodness. she had said, I've got a cosmetic problem. Yeah. But in fact, she's C4, and there's only C5 as leg ulcers. So yeah. she's almost at leg ulcers. And so not only do the CQC and people who are in the know still think of veins as a sort of cosmetic problem, but um, even patients do. And one of the biggest problems we have is patients come in and say, I've only got you know these veins, I've got a bit of aching legs, and sometimes they swell a bit. And they, they convince themselves they're only cosmetic. Mm. And then you do the scans, and you've got to explain to them, and actually they've got severe reflux, and if they don't sort them out, the randomised controlled studies have shown since 2007, their risks of complications and poor quality of life is higher if they do nothing than if they do it. So there's oh a medical goodness. need and, to actually operate on. And which what is one? reflux? Oh, sorry, reflux. So the reason you get varicose veins on the whole, there's several reasons, but the, the one that we sort of understand best is that the valves in the veins, the things that make the blood only go back to the heart and don't fall back down, yeah. fail. And if they fail, blood falls the wrong way or 
interestingly, when you're walking, the valves are meant to shut to stop blood squirting out on mm -hmm. um, things called perforators. And if they've failed as well, blood squirts out. And so it's like a colander when yeah. you contract your leg. And just as we were saying before, inflammation is very good for you, provided it is short, sharp, and only when needed, because mm -hmm. it's a healing process. All inflammation that is chronic is bad for you. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, something that's stuck inside you, you know, abscesses, anything. As soon as you have too much inflammation for any reason at all, you end up with cancers, you end up with destruction, you end up mm -hmm. with tissue. Inflammation is terribly, terribly bad if it's not appropriate. Yep, and the trouble with venous disease is, venous disease, if you have blood falling down the veins the wrong way, it causes inflammation at the ankles. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fix it, it causes clots, damage. And is that swelling. why you would see the sort of brown patches and the staining around the ankles then? Absolutely. And that's a, that's the, the brown staining is C4. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get to C5 and 6, that's leg ulcers. Wow. And we think that the problem that women get with pelvic congestion syndrome um, is an inflammation of the veins in the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And the reason when we get, um, and interestingly, our latest research, I'm flying to New York tomorrow to lecture to point out that men get it as well. Really? And a lot of men get, a lot of men get um, uh, chronic pelvic pain as well as women. Mm -hmm. And the, nobody's really put their, can see, but if you look at what happens in the legs and the inflammatory changes that cause leg ulceration in the legs, you can actually see the inflammatory changes starting also in the pelvis if you've got venous reflux in the pelvis. Wow. And we think a lot of the problems of um, certain things, like many, many women get told they've got endometriosis and they haven't got, got pelvic congestion. Mm -hmm. Many have low back pain, pain on sexual intercourse, um, which is called deep dyspareunia, hip pain, uh, irritable bowel, irritable bladder. And one of the things we're getting very interested at the moment, we're finding a lot of women who have been told they've got interstitial cystitis. Really? In other words, they've got irritable bladder, they get, as you say, the whoops moments, etc. They've got a lot of inflammation at the bottom of their bladder, and urologists and gynecologists keep biopsying it, trying to find a bug, and there isn't mm -hmm. one. If you look on the outside of an ultrasound, you find a lot of them have varicose veins, mm -hmm. and they have that same infl inflammation from this constant reflux mm -hmm. and the blood sitting in these veins. But you can only see it because you're using an ultrasound yeah, device, whereas... the transvaginal ultrasound, yeah, yeah exactly. which is what all the latest research is. And we're actually about to um, put in uh, some applications for some studies because we think a lot of ladies who have been um, classed as interstitial cystitis or pelvic floor problems actually um, have got venous problems that if you inject foam sclerotherapy into them can probably be cured. But that's, as I say, it's incredibly hot off the press. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's a we'll very have to do another talk idea. to discuss that. Yeah, well, there's going to be some studies and other things to prove it as well. But it is the, the whole understanding of the um, of veins has gone from being, I've got some varicose veins, they look cosmetic, to, oh my goodness, if you don't get your veins treated, you'll get leg ulcers, to, oh my goodness, the NHS is wasting a billion pounds a year on mm. leg ulcer dressings and we can cure them, to suddenly actually veins don't just affect the legs. It, it does seem that, you know, because people mm -hmm. are sort of lacking the education, sadly, you know, a lot of these things probably go sort of undiagnosed up until the point where it gets very, very serious and then they end up in in your care, I mean, I'm sure you probably see, I hear countless of women saying, oh, I've just got some spider veins that I need to get lasered yeah. off. But surely that's a sign of something far below the surface going, yeah. going faulty. Somewhere. There's a research study from Australia in 1999-2000 uh, by Somogen that shows that if you look at ladies who think they've got just leg, vein, uh, leg thread veins, in fact, 89% have got underlying venous reflux of varicose veins, and 45% is severe. So quite um, often people come in for a cosmetic procedure, or so they think, and actually yeah. you scan them and say, sorry, you've got varicose and, veins. And they're very good, you know, and we're getting more and more people in cosmetic clinics who are saying before I touch your veins and before I make a mistake I want you to have a scan and mm. then they have a scan and we send them out if there's something underneath we fix it first and send it back yeah. and that's without doubt the right way to do it because the, the, the best thing that can happen if you have legs Leg thread. It's not. It's different if it's above the heart, but for legs, this is. Why is it different above the heart? Oh, because of gravity. Oh, so, so okay. blood is going that way, and so you can you can do what you like to the thread veins of the face. Yes. You're just dealing with what you see. Yeah. And the legs. It's all about the gravity and the reflux. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, so the thing with it is, is if you if you treat thread veins on the surface, and you haven't treated the underlying one, if you're lucky, no, there's no harm. Mm -hmm. If you're unlucky, you might damage the skin. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem called telangiectic matting which is like a, it's a permanent red raised um, scar basically, and it looks like a birthmark. Mm -hmm. And we used to think it happened if you were allergic to, um, if you're allergic to sclerotherapy. It's now been shown that what it is, if you treat leg thread veins and there's underlying reflux, 
something happens in the healing because you haven't taken away the reflux. And if you mm -hmm. get this problem, you can then go back and try and treat the reflux. It doesn't matter, you've got that for life. You yeah. can't get rid of it. So that's the worst end of this scenario. So, mm -hmm. so that's why we say to anyone, if you've got leg thread veins, for goodness sake, make sure you get a duplex ultrasound scan done properly, biovascular technology, you know what they're doing, get anything underlying fixed first, and then go on to get so the... So see a specialist. Yeah. And how, what would be your sort of first port of call when you came to addressing sort of faulty valve, you know, what, what would be the most common treatment that you'd be doing, I suppose? Well, the, the, so, the, so if you... The thing that we learned at medical school is one of us, which is such a shame, and the, unfortunately we don't have consultant vein surgeons in the UK, in mm. the NHS. There is no training scheme for veins in the UK within the NHS and therefore medical schools don't treat veins. Mm -hmm. So almost every single person going to medical school is still taught that varicose veins and venous problems happen because your great saphenous vein or small saphenous vein have got valves mm -hmm. and they say two veins. They still come long and short even though 20 years ago the International Society said don't call them that. So it's all incredibly outdated. Totally. When you actually look at the veins now and what we do now, there's 150 perforators, mm -hmm. there's four truncal veins and often duplicated, and there's at least four pelvic veins. So you've got over 150 different causes for your varicose veins or venous problems. And most people, when you go and have your quick scan by a doctor, only check two of them. So the wow. first most important thing before you even think of any treatments is to get the diagnosis right. Yeah. And uh, because if you if you get the diagnosis wrong, you treat the wrong vein, you're not going to see advice. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the uh, issue will just worsen over time. Absolutely. And when you hear people say my veins always come back, it's it's almost definitely they haven't. They just weren't treated in the they first place. They tackled the wrong vein. And our research has shown clearly that the the um, most common cause of varicose veins going back in is that the doctors treated the wrong vein in the first place because mm. they didn't bother to treat the pelvic veins, perforators or trunk veins. So before you get on to how to treat the veins, you just have to treat the ones that... Treat the correct veins. Are, so then what we've then, the science has now shown that if you cut a vein and get a hematoma, as soon as you cut a vein and get a hematoma, that vein will just go mad, it will start growing everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's not surprising because if you had a gallbladder or a cesarean or appendix, you'd expect the veins to heal because yeah. a year later, if you go through the same scar, it bleeds, so they've clearly healed. But surgeons are wonderfully arrogant, and I can say that as a surgeon, yeah. is that when we take a vein out, we turn around and say, oh, the vein's gone. Now we've left mm -hmm. a vein in there with an end, we've got the hematoma, it heals. Yeah. And its healing is it's trying to find other veins because it thinks, or if it thought, it's, it's trying to close a wound. And that's why after surgery you often get green veins, red veins, blue veins and everything in an area. So we know that stripping a vein out doesn't work. And we published a, won a research prize and published in 2007 showing that if you have a stripping from the groin to the knee and you watch it, you can watch it growing back. You can actually see wow, it over it grows about back. yeah five percent uh, thirty three percent within one year and eighty three percent we published within eight years so oh it goes and when it goes back it never has a valve yeah so so therefore no valve so you it, stripping is useless um, and not only is it painful it just doesn't work and it actually causes more problems because now you've got more veins and yeah. you've got scar tissue so what we've discovered is you have to leave the vein in where it is and you have to destroy it in a way you trick the body into thinking that it's a bacteria or it's something else okay. and you get the body to eat it away it was what it said before the inflammation but oh, so it doesn't grow back. exactly yeah. and it ends up as a it's scar tissue which isn't there at all mm -hmm. so i'm worried about every research project that ever says the vein was closed at one year yeah. the vein should be absent at one year it shouldn't mm -hmm. be there the body should have eaten it away so when we come to talk about is it laser radio frequency is it phone sclerotherapy is it coils is it the new high food the high intensity focus ultrasound that does it all from the outside Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter, provided the cells in the vein wall have all been killed. Mm -hmm. The idea of protein contraction is not valid for veins. It's very good for what you want, because when you want your face to be lifted, you want a protein contraction. You don't want to kill the vein cells, uh, sorry, the skin cells, because otherwise you, you'd have a fibrosed face. In the veins world, we want totally different. We want to not only contract the protein, but we've got to kill the cells. So the cells stop expressing self-proteins on the surface and the body thinks it's foreign material. What happens then is the body sends in the white cells, the white cells eat it away, think it's foreign material, and it does the job for us. Fantastic. So all our protocols are based on get the right diagnosis and then only use the treatments 
depending on the size of vein, depth of vein, where it is, mm -hmm. that cause a transmural death. In other words, all the cells killed from the inside to the outside. Sense, this idea of sticky down. veins together never happens. It's, yeah. it's got to kill the vein. And what's the downtime for a patient who's having one of these sort of procedures with yourself? Well, that depends if it's just thread veins or whether they've got pelvic veins and recurrences and everything. It could be everything, anything. I mean, the one thing is, if you hear the word sclerotherapy for legs, yep. it's three weeks in compression. That's the foam uh, that you sort of put through the vein. Micro is it? sclerotherapy, yeah. yeah. Any, anything with the word sclerotherapy in. And the reason is, is when you use sclerotherapy, you destroy a vein, mm -hmm. but you do not close it. And you have to hold it closed because otherwise. Hence the compression. Hence, hence, yeah, whereas if you use heat te technologies or anything that closes the vein, you don't even need to wear compression because it's closed straight away. The most important thing to remember is, although we do amazing things nowadays, everybody does, I think, nowadays in medicine, the one thing we haven't and nobody's managed to do is speed up healing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've just written a whole new unfortunately for my poor patients, a 10-page <laughs> document that points out, please don't phone us after a week saying, I've still got some lumps and it's still a bit tender. Because yep. if we kill 40 centimetres of vein, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be as painful as ripping it out. It's mm -hmm. going to be much less. But if you're going to get healing, that healing will go on for 18 months. Now, you probably won't notice it after four to five weeks. But if you look, even if you have a blood test, nothing heals if you look under microscopes nothing yeah. heals for 18 months and you've got to you've got a sort of exponential curve where most of the healing is packed up the front mm -hmm. but you have to if you're going to do good medicine it's all about causing some form of trauma yeah. causing some sort of acute inflammation and then letting the body heal and regenerate in the way you want to and everything we're talking about has that same basic principle mm -hmm. anything that causes long-term inflammation is going to be bad anything that puts the body in a way that the body then heals as you wish to is good I suppose yeah the healing process you know has to go at its own pace doesn't it you can't you can't force it to sort of accelerate in any way you can um, slow it but you can't yes. speed it <laughs> yeah this is true as well I mean, there's a lot of common misconceptions when it comes to veins as well, you know, what causes them, what doesn't. Are there, are there any sort of myths surrounding that, you know, when we think of things like pregnancy, genes, mm -hmm. crossing legs, which I'm doing right now. Don't say this is No, it. no, it's fine. Crossing it's fine. legs is fine, yeah. okay, good. The, 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 the most important thing is choose your parents carefully, okay. because <laughs> your, um, your parents are, will give you the, the determination as to whether you're likely to get them or not. So mm -hmm. hereditary is the most important thing unfortunately because that's the one thing you can't do anything about yeah exactly the things that you can do about and this comes down to so many bits is exercise more than anything exercise walking is so good for veins unfortunately it doesn't prevent them and it doesn't uh, it doesn't slow down their deterioration because that's still the valves going but what it does is if for any pattern of vein disease we've got and how long you've had it your chance of getting a complication such as swollen ankles brown stains red stains ulcers bleeding clots all the things reduces the more exercise you do. Mm -hmm. So you stave off the complication, but it won't, it won't be the better, you've still got to have them treated at some yeah. stage. Uh, there is some evidence to show that if you um, use uh, uh, the citrus fruits or things called um, uh, micropurified flavonoid fraction, you do actually improve the cells and you do reduce well, the Well, by just eating them, citrus yeah, fruits? Well, you can either take a drug if you want to, or you can uh, you get the same drugs actually just from eating citrus fruits. And really vitamin well. C, obviously, as we know, is very beneficial as well. Yeah. So you can you can make the drug companies very happy and buy it in a, in a tablet, or you can eat lots of citrus fruits as well. And that actually gives this these um, MPFFs that are very, very useful for veins. Again, it doesn't actually stop the veins morphologically. It doesn't stop the structure that's going to cause a problem, mm -hmm. but it makes you feel better and it actually keeps the veins as healthy as possible for longer. I suppose it's also nice for us to feel that we're being proactive in doing something to sort of enhance long-term health. Um, I suppose, final question, what, what would be the sort of first steps to take if you do suspect that there's something amiss or sort of misbehaving with, with a vein somewhere? So, so the, 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 um, it's now been answered on uh, by the NICE guidelines. If, if it is venous reflux, uh, which is the common score, so either varicose veins you can see or hidden varicose veins, for reflux mm -hmm. you can't see, and you have any aching, tired legs, uh, anything where you want to put your leg up the wall uh, yeah. or lie down, or you have swollen ankles, you have red stage, brown stage around the ankles, ulcer or a healed ulcer, or any clots at all, 
you must have a venous duplex ultrasound scan. Mm -hmm. And if you have significant reflux, you must have treatment by intervene surgery. And that's not now an opinion. That is in the NICE guidelines, CG168 up on the website if you want to read it. Mm -hmm. And failure to be referred for that is actually breaking NICE standard, uh, quality standards. Really? Yeah. And so, so therefore, really, it, it's one of the difficult things about it. So we, we now know. And also, if you have any of those symptoms or signs mm -hmm. and you don't have treatment, your quality of life is reducing faster than any quality of life issues from the surgery you can have done. My and that's goodness. randomized control studies have done that, yeah. have shown it. That's the power of data, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Professor Whiteley. Also completely fascinating. Um, that wraps up sort of tonight's discussion, and I think we can all probably say from, from listening to our speakers, it's, it's very clear that these two worlds are definitely becoming more and more intertwined. You know, not only are we affecting positive change sort of to our appearance, but also to our underlying health. and. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, from what everyone said, that it certainly is uh, going to show that that cannot be underestimated. So really important, valuable points. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have time for a Q&A. If anyone does need to scoot off, we have goodie bags at the back, so please don't forget one on your way out. Um, I don't know if there were any questions in the audience. No hands. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, what do you think about uh, people with lots of moles? Because I'm really scared to do anything with my face. Because you can see I've got lots of moles. Does that so affect anything? Prevention, shielding from sun, obviously, just not to make the matters exactly. worse. Um, uh, I would definitely, you know, have a regular mole checks with dermatologists. Yes, uh, if you see something that is changing, you know, that's obviously that that requires a referral to a dermatologist just to to check everything. It's all fine, but I would like to. People and it depends what kind of what kind of moles they are in some But I'm, I'm worried about all procedures, basically all procedures. I'm worried how it's going to affect my moles. If it's safe. So again, depends on what it is. Not everything we don't need to. If if we think about skin boosters, we don't need to inject in those areas where the moles are. They're actually we avoiding those areas, not to stimulate anything. That's that's for sure. Um, with energy-based devices, you know we. With light treatments, that I wouldn't be worried about. That it's a safe wavelength of life, okay. of light, so it shouldn't uh, affect it in a negative way. Uh, and then if there is something that you know it is a little bit suspicious, so if it's just a skin tax, it can be safely removed. If it's something that is a little bit suspicious, then obviously we need to monitor it. So again, it would you know require a consultation. We need to look at what kind of moles and what kind of options you have. I don't think this is a contraindication for all the treatments. That's for does, sure. Does your skin imaging device show anything when you sort of see freckles and moles un under the sort of camera? That's usually you know we use dermatoscope for that. So just to to analyze the the more whether this is a skin tag or pigmented neva, you know, just to mm. distinguish what it is and, and then we can decide what type of treatment. But it's not like you can't, you shouldn't use anything. No, I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't well, be worried yeah. about that. I don't know if Dr. Rita would agree with Well, sure. it's not really my area, but from a, you know, sort of simplistic approach, and I'm sure you can, um, you know, discuss further, that any change in a mole, any sudden change, itchiness, bleeding, anything like that, and any change or appearance in mole over the age of 40 is quite mm. critical. Cool. So it over the age of 40? That's interesting. That, I mean, Accumulation of sun damage at yes. this point. You know, and also, else. you don't have to, you can have, having grown up in Australia, where back in the old days, you know, melanoma, that was, you were finished, you know, now it's changed a lot. But you can get melanomas, for example, in areas where you don't have the sun, you know, mm -hmm. so you think, you know, you forget to look in certain areas where you've never had any sun exposure and you can get a melanoma. So it's always good to have a nice check, uh, you know, at Absolutely. least once a year. And anything that changes, bleeds, <coughs> itches, it should be looked, okay. yeah, looked into. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And not, don't put it off. My husband's got a lot of balls and he's always putting it off, you know, and I'm always nagging. But apparently men have more skin cancer as yes. a result, don't they? Because they don't get their moles checked as frequently. And they don't use SPF. And they don't use SPF. <laughs> this is so true. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Was there another question? Yeah, I was thinking about having phyllo, um, but have very sensitive skin. Can you get patch tested for it? Can it go wrong? And is it... Very rarely so, because this is pure hyaluronic acid. There is nothing added to it. There's nothing added to chemically stabilize. It's only thermally stabilized. 
So the data that the company is providing us with, and there is lots of lots of procedures, you know, mm. I myself use it for probably four years now. Yeah. Uh, there are no adverse events in terms of intoleration to, you know, some sort of uh, hypersensitivities to, uh, to profilers. So again, the skin should be analyzed. We need to look into, you know, why are your skin so sensitive? You know, wh whether there are other treatments that may be more, uh, you know, uh, better for your skin before we will think of, of doing Profilo. But um, yes, I... Th there are some skin boosters, I think, that are sort of better suited maybe to sensitive skins as yes. well, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. But I don't think of, of any contraindications, you know, in terms of just skin being slightly reactive and then skin boosters. But again, I would look at the root of the cause, you know, why the skin is sensitive, uh, and, uh, and treat the barrier of the skin maybe first, you know, just to look into all those steps and then we can think of injectables. It's, we try not to jump into the injectable road uh, first, we try to fix, you know, the, the skin um, problems. First. I think a lot of the, the concern over safety with injectables as well is sort of the area that you're injecting, isn't it? Sort of whether there are sort of underlying vessels, structures that you need to be mindful of. But I think it's, is it correct that Profilo has been developed in sort of key areas so that it's, yes, it's avoiding those areas, vessels? Um, I think it was developed by a plastic surgeon or something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah you have sort of one here, one here, somewhere very five, painful. Five injection points, but we, you know, play with them depending on, you know, where actually patient need is, where mm. the skin is, at, you know, at the weakest, where we need to uh, hydrate the skin. Um, so but it's, it's a product that I find is quite yeah. soothing for patients. It actually, you know, helps them to retain water a little bit more. So and you can have it all over your body now as well, which is fantastic. Profilo body launched, I think, last year, didn't it? And exactly, we use it a lot. All yeah. over, yeah. Because so originally people were using the original Profilo and they were trying to do sort of backs of arms and hands and knees and then they luckily just developed a much bigger syringe. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Francesca, I have a question for you. Oh God, no one ever <laughs> asked me a question <laughs> on these things. Now, in summary, the same thing then... Uh, do you think, would you agree that uh, we're looking at, you know, cosmetic procedures, sometimes premature ageing, but this is often, an, especially after Professor Whiteley's talk, that it's an indication perhaps we're doing things that's causing premature ageing internally. Mm -hmm. You know, are we watching our gut biome? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? So yeah. various things that we can see on the surface that maybe look, you know, I want to, my skin to glow a bit more, or I want this, or I want that. That there's actually a root cause that if we fix that, it will help us with anti-aging and get us better into that health span situation and lifespan. What do you think? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you know the whole conversation has shown that there are always these baseline things that we need to address. You know, we spoke about hormones, about sleep, about stress. Um, diet, taking enough exercise, and I think you're correct. If if you tick all those boxes, then I think whatever you're doing aesthetically is only going to enhance that. But I do think it's fantastic that we're seeing so much support sort of from one side. You know, the aesthetics world is looking to medical devices now to to help us go in that direction. And sometimes the first indicator, you know, you might think, oh, you know, I'm pretty healthy, I'm doing the right thing, yeah. but then you have this or that or. I think it's a positive message as well. Mm. It sort of suggests that, you know, we shouldn't just be immediately going to the aesthetic sort mm. of treatments to try and fix something. You know, like you're saying, patients coming in for Botox after lockdown. Well, yes. actually, probably what they need to do is address all sorts of other things before they actually tackle that sort of top, top most yes, layer. that little line. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's going back to, to this lady question, you know, mm. I just she was worrying about injectable, but actually there is a, another problem there with the skin. And yeah, looking exactly. very closely into that, you know, from all the angles, maybe she won't need profile. Maybe maybe it would be enough to, you know, to do something else. And, yeah, exactly. Um, and just look at all the, the issues. And but they've shown mean? now, and even the normal cosmetic companies have got this sort of biome of the skin. So if your gut biome's good, mm -hmm. you know, your skin will grow more. And, uh, you know, eating less refined sugar and all the sorts of things that Absolutely. will affect your skin yeah. just from your healthier lifestyle. But it's really struck me that all three of you have sort of spoken so clearly about data as well. You know, it's it's come into every conversation we've had and, you know, whether it's an ultrasound duplex scan for our veins or whether it's a, a skin sort of analysis to see what's going on below the surface, I think it's very empowering to have that data and I think it really enables us to navigate what you described, Dr. Argy, as being such an overwhelming industry. You know, where do you start? What do you do? So at least having that benchmark of, of what is going on below the surface, I think that is really relevant as well. Absolutely. Were there any other questions? Yes, lady here. Um, so going back to where do you start? Yes. Obviously, the three of you are fabulous, and we'd all come all the time if we could. But you mentioned that the CQC don't look at aesthetics and medicine. Mm. So apart from 
you know, don't get Botox from your dentist, which we all know we shouldn't do, and word of mouth, where else do you start to find a really good practitioner? Well, <laughs> funny you should ask. Yeah, 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 I think it was about over 20 years ago I founded the British, with Patrick Boland, the British Association of Cosmetic Doctors, and there's now 300 members. 400? Oh, 400, <laughs> sorry. Back in the old days, there were only plastic surgeons and dermatologists. And uh, when uh, Patrick and I were having a conversation and they've just brought in validation. We said, well, you know, we don't exist. <laughs> you know, we're not surgeons and we're not um, and dermatologists, but we are doing all the cosmetic side. So that's mm -hmm. when we first started it. And it's uh, associations like that. There's also, you know, safety and beauty. There's various, you know, safe face. But I think probably uh, the best group to look at is uh, the British Association of Cosmetic Doctors. British College of Aesthetic yes, Medicine. Yes, no, 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 <laughs> Do Which Dr. Rita founded, yeah. so um, obviously under that name, that now it's called British uh, College of Aesthetic Medicine, BCAM. So that you can have a look at the website. There's a lot of educational information for patients. Um, and there is a list of practitioners that All over do the country. appraisals every year, that do revalidation every five years, that have been accredited through a very rigorous process. So that at least you know that you know this group of practitioners is actually you know really well educated and. And I do embedded. understand your reservation about the dentist, but actually I think they do say a doctor, prescribing nurse, or dentist. At least those medical professionals have had adequate training to understand the sort of anatomy of the face, and hopefully your dentist will then know which areas to avoid or sort of hit or whatnot. But and I, I think would so look much at, is yeah. sorry to interrupt is experience. You know, you can exactly. have a mm, surgeon who true. does Botox once a year. Or you have his assistant nurse who's very experienced. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. as I said, there's, a, there's also different classes of Botox. You know, there's sort of uh, the normal type of Botox, then there's serious Botox for, you know, migraines or, you know, various Grinding other medical teeth. complications. So you have to look at what you're having and who's doing it. You're so right. I think it's how often somebody is doing it. And I've actually heard stories of incredibly well-established surgeons just going, oh, you just need some Botox, I'll do it for you. But like you say, they do it once a year and it goes wrong. And But from the patient perspective, how would they know? So again, we're going back to looking at, you know, if someone is actually involved in association like that, which they don't have to be, that means that they spend a lot of time and a lot of the education, a lot of time of the clinic time is, is devoted into aesthetic practice. So that's one way of... And you have a supervision of your clinic as well. You know, you have to have so much retraining. You have to uh, participate, you know, in the uh, uh, educational events, events, you know, like um, uh, things that could go wrong, all that sort of thing. So to be a member, an active member, and also you can't be doing treatments that the general medical community thinks are ridiculous, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, so, and uh, they're, they're becoming less and less, but you know, you know. It's a level of responsibility and... And, and, and you know that if you yeah. go to one of those doctors, you're going to be reasonably safe. And Professor Whiteley, is there a way that we can find the best vascular surgeon who is also going to be sort of doing things appropriately? So, so the whole way that medicine is going, so it all started really in 1990, when 30 to 35 children died in Bristol, and the heart surgery, it was a Bristol heart scandal. And what the government got involved in is they turned around and said that the public really should know what's happening and if there's a problem, where the problem lies. And since then, there's been registries. And what registries do is registries, every single patient is put in anonymously, and then they are followed up as to what their outcomes are. Now, it started off just in heart surgery, then it went to cancer, now most joints. Uh, it's, it's when you start finding things like the breast implants that go wrong, the hip surgery, mm -hmm. the, the hips that go wrong, it's because rather than one doctor saying, oh, I think this one, I've seen that happen before, you suddenly have the whole country, maybe the whole world, feeding in data. In the veins world, we set up the College of Biology Venus Registry, and the only people who don't join is the people who are trying to hide their results. Um, so what, what the way we set it up is, um, it's basically, uh, if you see your vein a doctor, they put the information about you in there. They also put in your, the only thing that's related to you that they would ever find is your email address. And that's encrypted so it can't be hacked. And then you put in your results. Did you ever need your veins done again? And that goes on. Now that's going to happen in the aesthetics world because the reality is at the moment, the only real outcome is are your patients happy? 
And if a dot is not on a registry, it means you're sort of taking it a bit on faith that you hope they're good, word of mouth, you've spoken to the right people. And you might be spoke to someone who hates that person. It might be the only bad person they've ever had. So, so the, there's the sort of credibility side first. Then there's the trust doctor and doctor fire and things, which is mainly was the doctor nice to you and you know, was the coffee good. But it gives you some outcome. But it's only when you actually have proper registries where patients have an input, not do doctors just say, oh, yes, I did a good job, but the patients then keep feeding back year in, year out. Do you get the outcomes? Currently so, known so, as the internet. Yeah, no, but, but, <laughs> Google but reviews. It, no, no, so, no, no, I'm, no, I'm you, only joking. I'm you, joking mustn't, you mustn't trust reviews because they can be put up by anybody. You must ask always. I'm joking. You know, yeah, that's but, the thing you said. It's, hard, it's very difficult. No, but it's not if you look for people who are members of not registries not that registries. are proper registries. And registries are coming everywhere. And so, so it's very important if in your speciality there is a registry already, the doctors who aren't part of that registry have, are not part of it for a reason that they've decided to be. So in veins, it's simple now. In heart disease and everything, it is. I'm not sure if a registry is coming for aesthetics yet. Becoming is, is a sort of registry. But, of, not, but no, do you no, get not, feedback? Not like not without the feedback. No. Yes. So, so it will come. The answer is eventually, you know, always ask your doctors and nurses and dentists, are they part of a registry? If not, why not? And if they say because there isn't one and they're right, that's fair enough. But otherwise, you know, you'd be careful of anyone who's not only up to all their data not being overseen the whole time. That's great for all healthcare. Yeah. I, I, I do now. When, when a member of my family phones up and says, there's so and so a problem, because I'm so into veins, I don't know any other doctors now. So, you know, so if I forgot to look up for someone for hemorrhoids or hernias or something, I instantly go there and I see if there's a registry. And then you go on the registry and you see who's actually got good figures. It's really good advice because I think generally in medicine we've been taught not to question doctors but actually I think what all of you are saying is that actually you do need to do your research, you do need to ask those questions. It's important to educate yourself to the best of your ability before you go in for these procedures in case it goes wrong. Great question. Thank and I think yeah. what has changed dramatically in the last whatever 50, 20, 10 years is that the science has improved so much. So back in 100 years ago, uh, you know, virtually all doctors were doing the same thing. Mm. Whereas now, within a few years, it can change dramatically. And in your field, yes. uh, I mean, it's what what I've heard this evening has been sort of, yeah. uh, you know, very uh, very educational. You know, when I was at medical school, you know, even now, as you said, it, so it, it's changing. There's so much knowledge now that you have to look at it as it's evolving so quickly. Whereas and that's why you have to question more. Mm. And in these registries and various associations, the doctors have to retrain. They have to pass, you know, validation exams, mm. all that sort yeah, of thing, to them. stay in the group every year. Otherwise, you're out. Mm. That's a really Thank important you. point. Thank you very much for the question. Are there any other questions? This lady over here. Dr. Rinkers, I just wanted to ask, because there's so many machines coming out, and obviously you've now got this new one come out. I mean, how, how do they all compare? Is it that the older ones you don't really want to go to anymore? So you've got morphia safe, you've got endo lift, you've got, you've just said end phase and all that. They virtually do all the similar sort of things. I thing think, that for example, you know, the same as, as I said, I know iPhones is sim simplifying yeah. it, but fortunately or unfortunately, the technology is going like through the roof. And I remember going to a very good lecture by an eminent uh, international colleague. And I mean, this is sort of from the business side. He said, you know, I uh, just get prepared that you get a new machine, it'll probably be uh, the latest thing for about a year or 18 months and then get ready to throw it out because the new model will be in that can produce better results. So basically what is important is that you go to doctors that have got their finger on the pulse. And for example, uh, we've been doing facelifting treatments for over 20 years and it's either been radio frequency, ultrasound or a combination of both. Now the latest one for ultrasound only uh, is Softwave and that is a revolutionary, it was designed by um, the fellow who's originally hair removal, IPL, okay, you know, yeah. the gentleman. So it's seven parallel beams of ultrasound that only go 1.5 millimetre into the skin and it gets results that you wouldn't believe, but also it doesn't cause any harm. There's no fat loss, there's no nerve damage, there's no this. You can get beautiful results on the neck. Now, Softwave hasn't been out for that long, but it has definitely, and I won't mention, I mean, other machines still do work. But I thought the latest one was Morpheus 8, and I thought that was doing it. No, oh, it's no, not. No. 
Ah, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a new machine. It's, that's probably the latest microneedling radio frequency device. Unless you have anything newer. Do either of you have Well, the funny anything? thing is that I've just had a friend that's just had two goes on it, and I couldn't see anything. Now, I know it's early days. Yes, I guess well, it, it has to be so for time. the right treatment, yeah. doesn't it? I think the whole Judy Murray story definitely missold Morpheus aid. And, oh, yeah. and also, um, as Dr. Ever mentioned, that, you know, having a microneedle, you see, you've got to uh, have a treatment for what you need, not yeah. the machine. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Morpheus 8 or any microneedling devices are more for skin texture, skin, it's not so much for lifting. And then, are you mixing it with things like exosomes and that exactly. sort of thing? So, that's what's important. And, but also, indications are yes. important. Patients with acne scarring and large pores, they will be still benefit more from Morpheus 8. While, you know, if we're talking about lift, you know, the new technology, software, are amazing devices. So, it again goes by. And if you need both, then it's, a, then it's a combination. Yeah. And it's also your age, your skin condition other you know do you have rosacea do you have acne scarring I think another important point is the sort of approach where you're layering a lot of these devices as well so often it's not just one device that you know wields the best results sometimes it is that combining approach and what's strength and how we, we we have this sort of little saying in the clinic we say we tr we think we've got the ferrari of machines but uh, we're not learner drivers we're f1 drivers so <laughs> just because you've got a morphia say it doesn't mean if it's in the hands of 10 different people you're going to get the same results yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it that it goes on and, and also the strengths of these that. machines you know you can have a much stronger treatment with various machines mm. uh we do, um, you know, multiple treatments, so it really depends so much. Absolutely. So Professor you're saying that basically the Softwave, M Face, these are the, the Rolls Royce of. Well, not, to, not lift, quite, because they, yeah, they're sort of for, for lift and tightening, yes. Mm -hmm. And what about Endo Lift? Endo Lift, we've used Endo Lift a lot. I like Endo Lift, but you see, then it depends on your patient. Yeah. Do you want any downtime? Do you want a local anaesthetic injection? Okay, yeah. uh, do you want some swelling afterwards? Also, uh, there's a lift from someone who's like 30 and hardly got anything. And as Rebel Wilson says on the ads, you know, she just wants a face snatch. To someone who's 60 who doesn't want to have a facelift or can't have a facelift, has got everything wrong with them, including a double chin, this and that. So it really depends on what what's wrong with you, what you need, you know, and all that sort of thing. And then you choose your device and sometimes you have multiple devices. Mm. Right. How long do they last though? It, it depends so much again on how what your age is, your collagen, you know, all that sort of thing. But it varies from 12, 18 months. So say for example we do a lot of ultra cell Q plus and we do two What's ultra cell Q plus? That ultra is ultrasound and radio frequency. Mm. So we do um you know, a lot of clinics only do one treatment. We do a free top up at three months and one at six months, and then that sort of stretches the longevity of the machine out to about, you know, two years, two and a half years. But it's not for everyone. So, uh, you know, if you're someone that needs a lot of work and you've got bad circulation, you know, you um, you know, you eating the wrong food, all that sort of thing, a lot of sun damage, you've got diabetes, you're smoking, uh, because that affects the circulation in your skin and you're under a lot of stress, it's going to be a different situation from someone who's very healthy. So it's hard, but they range from, oh, you know, we've got the shorter ones like Exilis, Pelleve, three months, six but months. But some of them also don't show results until after yeah. three months, yeah. after six months as well. So it's because you have to, remodeling. And yeah, we often you do, have to manage those expectations. We do I a suppose. fast acting with the long acting, like we'll do a Pelleve or double Exilis with the ultra cell. So you get an immediate lift that lasts about three months while the other bigger ones kicking in, you know, yeah. so. Great, were there any more questions we didn't come to? No, okay, well, I think that's everything for this evening. I found it completely fascinating to listen to tonight's panel. I hope you did as well. I hope you found it helpful. Um, I'm sure if you have any more questions, they might hang around for a little longer if you have anything um, that you don't want to put your hand up for. Um, but yes, a huge thank you to our amazing Beauty Triangle. Thank you.
who are all completely brilliant and experts at what they do. So yes, do do sort of call on them. Um, thank you for joining us. It would be amazing to see you at further events that we do. Hopefully back here at Fox Hills. If not, you know, elsewhere, you know, do leave your email address. We'll sort of add you to the mailing list, and we'll make sure you're always first to know about our upcoming talks. Um, and yes, do leave your referral cards. Take your programs so you can sort of read up on these guys a little more. Um, and I hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.